Uh, oh, golly. So how long ago did you do your last balloon flight? That's when I first met this firm, because I had so much fun, and I want you to know that. And this club has really impressed me, so I was really nervous to come here tonight, because I think you have a lot of really smart people here. <laughs> not that the other clubs are not smart, but you're really smart. The other thing which makes me nervous is this is an entirely new presentation. I've changed my presentation completely. So I don't know how this is going to go. The other thing I want to say is everything I present is on the website. Okay, the presentation is there completely, and everything I know about this, I put on that website. These cards have my email address on it and the website, and we'll pass them around so that you can make sure you don't miss that. Can you do that, Ellen? Okay, now, when I, my previous presentation only had three parts. This one has six parts. And I've changed the character of it. The original presentation, the main emphasis was for me to convince you that you should do this. That was a year ago. So much has happened in this year that I don't feel I need to convince people to do it anymore. Because a lot of people are doing it. So what I'm doing now is I'm also talking about what people have done and what they're doing. And then I get a lot of questions. There are four, no, there are two controversies that I always meet. Part, people that want to do part 15 and people that want to do part 97. The other controversy I get is I want to do mesh or I want to do backbone. So I've got these four poles going around me all the time with a lot of opinions about them, which I'm going to try to at least give some substance behind those, that, a discussion of that. Let's hear it for hybrid circuits. Hmm? Let's hear it for hybrid circuits. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, all right, so first I want to know, has anyone heard of broadband ham net? This, is, this is, seems unusual. Anyway, has anyone heard of broadband ham net or HS? Anybody heard of that first thing? Yep. Okay, so you know that. What about the middle two? BC Warren, Ham Wan. Oh boy, this is going to be interesting. Ham Wan, or any of those? So you. Okay, and then the last one, Central PA IP Network. Okay, now the C the C C A I P is a, is Central Pennsylvania Network. It's the largest network in the United States. Maybe the one in Texas might be larger. That's a hard. They're so different to, to compare them. But it's right our next door neighbor, so it's really nice. So these, at the top of this presentation, there's some maps which show these networks. The one, up, the one on, the, on, your, on my right, uh, there, uh, yes, this is going to be difficult. That way, that's the original <laughs> in Texas, okay? And then the middle two, and you see the others' names. I just put the maps up to give you an idea of how they looked typogra topographically. Okay, these are the main points, and I don't know if these <coughs> points are going to continue this away, but these are absolutely the most important ones. Is there anyone here that doesn't think the future is digital? Okay, I can take that one off the list. Okay, the next thing is redundancy, redundant, no central point of failure. Now, the reason for this one is because a lot of what I've been pushing is for support emergency communication. And one of the main things there is you actually have to work in an emergency, so you want the redundancy and stuff. And that's the reason for that. The other reason for that is related to the next two, that we, I see the whole amateur community as something to offer redundancy. If we can get up our own network, a lot of people are going to have the amateur network work when something else fails, because we're, we'll be totally private, totally independent of everything the county and the state and other people do. So that's what the redundancy comes in at. The next two are extremely important. When I talk to hams, a lot of them start saying, this is where the part 15, part 97 thing comes in. They want to see hams as it's always been. I see hams as an expert group of people. You're experts in RF. So that's why I don't care about the part 15, part 97 argument, because it's RF, wherever it is. First of all, the frequencies are shared between these two things, so it's not a question of frequency. It doesn't have to be a question of frequency. So to me, it's really a question of you supporting what is needed, regardless of, of which rules it comes under. And then the backbone. I started over a year ago buying a lot of mesh nodes, and I put them up, and I couldn't talk to anybody because I was the only one that had them. And even if someone else had bought them, they were too far away. So I realized that this, I love mesh. I think it's a great idea. But it's not going to work unless we can connect meshes to other meshes. And that's why I personally just has been working now just to set up a backbone. 
Okay, the last two, the bandwidth regulated spectrum, I think I still have that as part of the uh, presentation that will probably disappear later. The reason for that is, is because there are gonna be a lot of changes in the rules on spectrum. Uh, mainly because the telephone companies and all these people wanna pay a lot of money for spectrum. So the amateurs are getting squeezed. That's what that's gonna to come to. And the last one I bring up is to, to get rid of any arguments of people having preferences, because it doesn't matter which one of these things we do. The important thing is that we do some, that is the important thing I want to get across. Okay, this is a new, a new video. This is a long video, it's on the web. I didn't put the URL in here. So what you've got to do when you go home is you write in there, internet could crash, we need plan B in YouTube, or if you know TED, T-E-D and TED, and watch this whole thing, because I've just, I've cut it to pieces here now. Um, Okay, now I don't know if you can hear this because I didn't bring an amplifier. Okay, now I don't know how well that hurt. I'm gonna to have to remember to bring an amplifier. So I didn't know about this. This, this wasn't on TED. And by the way, TED is a fantastic site to visit to look at the videos. Um, so this gentleman says, okay, we, we're getting so dependent on the internet. Everybody's dependent on the internet for everything. And it fails once in a while. I'm sure some of you in here have noticed it fails. That's failed at my place. I have my telephone on the internet now, so I lose my telephone. Uh, so we're going to need some reserve capacity. We're gonna need multiple reserve capacities. And that's what I want amateurs to do. I want amateurs to supply one of these alternatives to the internet. And we can do it. And this video really pushes that point of view. And his point of view there is, it's very hard for me to convince you that we need to do it as long as the internet is working so fine because who's gonna use what we put up, okay? But it is still essential we do it, okay? And that's what that, so go and search this and look at the whole video because I think it's definitely worth, worth watching. All right, another one I bring up for emergencies. This one's a little older, so I don't know if I'm gonna play the whole thing. On the 35W bridge collapsed last week, cell phone towers were overwhelmed in that area of Minneapolis. But another high-tech communications tool kept people connected, and it's also helping with recovery operations over the last week. Got a little snow climb tonight showing you why city leader. I'm not gonna play that whole video. I just wanted to give you the point of view that in an emergency, when things fail, cell towers like they did in Boston and things, we can be there. So I'm emphasizing the emergency side of this, okay? Now I don't wanna overemphasize that. I do it because it's so important. But if we get a ham network, a separate internet up, like the other day when I was talking to someone, he says, okay, when we do logging nowadays, if you're doing logging for a contest, we could use the, our network to get to the internet to do the logging. So even if the internet is up, the ham network could supply a connection to places that are difficult to get to, do, to get to now or where you have to use your 4G telephone to do it. If we can get this network out to the repeaters and things, we'll have access to high-speed communications when we need it. So it's not just for emergencies. There are many other cases. Okay, All right, this one here is an older slide I had, and this has to do with the politics of this, and I have a slide afterwards if you can't hear it about what he, what he talks about. This is the FCC, a gentleman at the FCC. This is an interesting uh, subject that uh, really applies to this, this group more than probably anything else. You know, in the commercial sectors, organizations pay for their spectrum. 
there is significant economic incentive to use the resource efficiently. All right, now, what he's talking about is competition here, okay? And this is his slide. Now, what I like about this slide is you're selling meat and you're selling milk and you're selling vegetables. It's bits per second per hertz, just like you talk about pounds and kilos and gallons. That's what he's talking about. This means no more than that to the FCC. So you've got a spectrum, we're going to chop it into pieces, and we want to get the most value per bit across this spectrum. So this is what's squeezing us, the spectrum, the whole time. And you know when we went from wideband to narrowband, it was the same thing. So there's this constant pressure to get more information on every little piece of frequency we have. And he talks about in here very sensibly, and this, this pains me a little bit, justify free. In my generation, it was good with hands and free, but now it seems like it's not modern anymore. So we got a lot of pressure to do something with this. And he says very clearly in this presentation that we have to show the FCC that we still can be modern, we still can do advances, and we can still contribute. And it's in this area, I know, is an area we can do a lot with. And if we don't, the Wi-Fi people, the telephone people, they're going to. They're going to do it anyway, but you can try. Okay, now, this is new for this presentation. There are a lot of networks out there. Now, you people that raised your hand earlier know about the broadband ham network and this started out in Texas, okay? There are a lot of nodes out there. This is very, I think this is a wonderful thing they've done. The problem is they started out with Linksys. It's really cheap and it's a really good piece of equipment, but it's getting old, old, old and it doesn't go very far. So they're now replacing it with ubiquity stuff. And I use all ubiquity stuff nowadays because it's modern and they've really made it cheap. The prices have come down enormously. Okay, this is BC Warren. This is a group up in, uh, is this one in uh, Canada, right? British uh, Columbia. British Columbia, right. Uh, they have directed themselves only to emergency to connect hospitals and EOCs. It's a very tight group, a very closed group, okay? But they, and they have a very focused perspective. And I, I want you to think about how you want to focus on what you're going to do. If you're going to support EOCs, I hope we get a backbone which can support everybody. But EOCs would be on that backbone, the amateurs would be on that backbone, other services would be on that backbone. <coughs> okay, this is in Europe, I'm not gonna say too much about it, but they, they've done a lot there. This one was rather new to me, I didn't know about it. Now, I like the other map better, but this is the Google map I have, the, the satellite map. This is in uh, just south of San Francisco, it's a very large net. And I, didn't ha I don't have it in this presentation, but there's a gentleman, Greg Anderson, which has a YouTube video which I, I think, I, I put it up on my website now, so it's on the website at the top. He has an extremely good video, which I absolutely recommend you look at. Uh, it's not technical, it's really about what his experience is that he's been trying to do this in California, and the problems he ran into, and the experience of what he's learned about. It's a really good network. You'll notice that he goes to hospitals and EOCs, so that was his direction. Is that the one that includes the uh, link across the desert, 10 miles across the desert? He does, no, this one doesn't. But this is the largest one I know on the East Coast. So it's extremely interesting. West Coast? Oh, West Coast, excuse me. This is absolutely a very interesting network and very friendly gentleman. Okay, now this is our network. This is in Pennsylvania. This is in Harrisburg. The gentleman there, Gary Blacksmith, has over 60 nodes. I think he has 70 nodes now on tops of mountains in, in there. And he's extremely friendly and will help anyone. I mean, he he's, he's absolutely goes out of his way. There aren't very many nodes on this map, but he has a very big network. And why it's really interesting to me is because last year we got a note from Red Lion down to Gamble Park, which I live in Frederick. It's 55 miles, so we got a connection to his network, which is a, a very big accomplishment. I was very proud of that. Okay. Okay, now this is where I've been working here to get these nodes up, what you see there. Hagerstown, we haven't reached yet. Frederick, Damascus. Rockville, Haymarket, Baltimore, Fredericksburg. All of these except Hagerstown have somebody working on them, doing the stuff. I'm sorry if I'm in your way there. I'm sort of trapped in between these things. Um, so there are groups working on all of these things. I'm trying to get to Hagerstown. Um, are they covered as bad hooks? Uh, no, they, 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 I don't think they have any significance now. Originally they were showing new stuff as opposed to stuff we got up and everything, but they're out of date. I haven't made a new map in a long time. Okay, now I'm going through the stuff that we've actually done and accomplished last summer, really. Okay, 
the node I put up myself, which is in the upper, this corner over here, is in Braddock Heights, and down in the other corner over there, that's the fire department in Damascus. And that's an 18 mile link between Damascus and Braddock Heights. And that was the first node that I got up. Um, and I, at that time, I thought it, it was really nice. It uses this antenna, which I, I should tell you, maybe this is the time I won't mention this. This is, this is the largest radio I use, this one here. It is 800 milliwatts, okay? This is a 30 dB antenna. It gives you about 600 watts ERP out of this, which is more than enough to do anything. This is the unit that we use to go 55 miles to Red Lion. Okay, it's a two foot dish. It's pretty light, okay? It's a, I, you, this is the workhorse. You can do anything you want. Which model is it? Um, 5G30 is the number they have. So you, everything I have is ubiquitous. And it's on the website. Everything is on the website. Okay. okay. And I think I mentioned it in my book. Okay, this is the smallest unit, which is out, uh, not modern now. This is the actual radio. This is the dish. I think this costs $60. I don't know if you can get this one anymore. I don't know. Um, I don't remember how many dB this was. I'm thinking it's 18, 19, I don't know. This one was 30. Now on the back of this is the actual radio. Maybe I can get it out easily. Let's see, no, I can't. This slides off. So you buy these two as separate. This one comes as one unit. This unit here costs, uh, I think, $150 for the parabolic, and the radio is 85. Whereas this one here was like 60 or 70 for the whole thing. Um, now I usually, or often, I'd say usually, you know, I usually have a lot of other antennas with me, and I'll show some of them in the presentation as we come. But this is the unit we use from Damascus to Braddock Heights. It's also the unit we use up to Red Lion from Frederick. And what band is that? Uh, everything I'm showing is on five gigahertz, so uh, maybe I'll bring that up. I'm gonna come into all that later. Okay. Now this was Haymarket. There was a ham in Haymarket. That's his tower you see there. I just said it can. And uh, the KE210 is his call sign, and W4BRM, you might know him. That's a call sign he's repeated. Um, he went and put an antenna up on his, in his tower, and it's hard to see on this one here. I'll make sure a better picture. I've got a better picture than this later. What he did is he put up a sector antenna. If you've looked on the top of a cell phone tower, you'll notice a really long, thin antenna, like this, just a long, thin kind of thing. That's a sector antenna. And the reason it's called a sector antenna is you buy them for 60 degrees or 90 degrees or 120 degrees, and they cover that sector, sector of a circle. So it's not like a dish where you get a beam this way. This keeps it vertically straight and horizontally restricts the beam. So if you want to cover 360 degrees, you can buy four 90s or three 120s and put them together and you get the 360 like you do for Nomni, but you've got more power because you'll have one, two, three, or four <coughs> transmitters on each antenna. It gives you other possibilities of controlling. So that's a sector antenna. So he put up a sector antenna and I've got a better map later. He covers his northern edge, he's got a, he's in a, a little bowl of mouth. His northern edge is about going from Haymarket to Dulles. And the southern edge of his goes down to Manassas. So he covers that whole segment there out to over 12 miles. So anybody in that, it's a 140 square mile area, anyone in that segment can get an antenna. If they can get line of sight, you can connect to him. Okay? Very nice way to do things. So it's not just point to point. You can do what I would call point to multiple. Ah, there's his, uh, no, that's another guy's antenna. Okay, all the way to the Red Cross one was another link I did last year to the Red Cross building in Frederick. And I think it's actually this little antenna I'm using. Yes, okay. The one on, the, on this side over here is a unit I have. That's a sector antenna, by the way. That long, thin thing is a sector antenna. It's a, it's a 90 degree sector, I think. Uh, and that one I have on an auto repair place in Frederick, just as, an, as a separate node to see who can get on it. The middle one is John's KA3ALO. He put that on his antenna. He doesn't have anybody to talk to, at least the last time I talked to him he didn't. He's pointing east from Gamble Mountain. But like I said, these, these little sector antennas will go about 12 miles if there's nothing in a line of sight. Okay, this is the most proud link I was gonna tell you. And what makes it easy, well, easy to do 55 miles? You see there are two big towers. So on both ends of that one on top of a tower, we've got the large dish, and we did 55 miles. So distance is not a problem if you've just got clear, really good line of sight, okay? Uh, okay, now, now the MAIPM, MAPEN, the reason for that is I don't know what to call all this. 
So now I apologize. I like big words. This is Mid-Atlantic IP Network. Now the choice for this name came to me from the fact that I like TMARC for regulating repeaters. I think we need to have an organization exactly like TMARC for this project. We do not have any organization today, but I think we should have one. It should be organized. I don't know that much about TMARC, but I think it will be organized similarly. Because what we need here is coordination of frequencies, choices of hardware, to help people connect reasonably. And so some organization that would just have that function, it doesn't have any regulatory function, but just to help people coordinate so you know who you can talk to. Okay, now this was the network up in Pennsylvania. This shows some of his nodes. I'm just gonna go through these quickly. All right, this was the one down in Haymarket. That orange figure is the sector he covers from Dulles down past uh, Manassas. Okay, at the bottom of that, you'll see the yellow lines. Now, I don't know what that group has done. I haven't talked to them since the, the, the winter. Uh, it was the old Virginia Hams, and what's the other group? I've forgotten the name of the group that's further south. Or right, now we're gonna to connect to the water tower in Manassas and connect up to his node. So that's going to be a little cluster develops in that part of the, of the state. And that, you know, we're getting, getting close to where you are for that. So this is, this is going to be interesting. Okay, now this is up in Frederick. The red line was the one up, went up to Pennsylvania, and all of those colored lines I have tested with a van, which you'll see later, to see how far south we could go. So we can go from Gamera Park way down south here, way past Leesburg, down, oh, I don't remember what the southern point is. It's, it's, we can get to Haymarket, that I know. Okay, but we don't have anybody to talk to there yet. Now, there are some repeater nodes up in the mountain that have agreed to connect us, and I'm looking forward to actually getting antennas on those towers this summer, I mean, this, when it gets warm. Okay, so those colored lines are sort of places I know we can get to if we get a park there to talk to. Does it look like it's possible to get to Redmond? Hmm? Does it look like it's possible to get to Redmond? Okay, now distance-wise, yes. Okay, oh. now I can explain, this is probably a good place to explain this. With line of sights and so forth, you see this dark green area here? This is the mountain range. I can get to anywhere on either side of that range. Getting to something on the range, I can't do because the range itself blocks it. I'm on the range at the top, and as I go down, the range constantly is blocking me. So I have to go on one side or the other or find a higher point down here. So I'm hoping to get to the NERA repeater if it's higher enough for me to get to it from, from Frederick. So I mean, line of sight is, is what it's about. But I can get to right, right the Leesburg, when we're gonna try that as soon as it gets a little bit warmer, okay? Uh, on the east side of that mountain range, <laughs> on the east side of it. Okay, now this is, this is a, a uh, we connected to, to Damascus. And Damascus is up a little high, so the Damascus people now are gonna connect back to the Mark group, the Montgomery County group. So we're gonna come back east that way. The orange line going up diagonally, that's the one that goes up to the, no, it's not. <coughs> that's not the one, huh? I'm missing the line here. I'm missing, I'm missing the one that goes from, from Bradley Heights. Uh, so, so what does these, all these lines mean? What happened was that the people at DEC, D-E-C-T in Damascus, said we want to connect to all the members in the club. So all of these lines that come out there, all the green lines is what I went into Google Earth. <coughs> so, have it, you go into Google Earth, load it on your machine, go into Google Earth, put a point where your house is, find one of the points on my site that you want to connect to, draw a line between them, and then you go up to a menu and say, show me the profile of this, and you will get a profile which I've, you can see. An altitude profile. Right there, at the bottom of that is a profile line showing the altitude of all the terrain between the two points. If you've got it even less clear than that, if you've got a clear line like that, then you can think about doing the connection. And one of the things people don't realize, but what you can do is when you've got that line there and you've got your profile at the bottom, you can grab the end of the line and just move it all around and that profile will follow you. So you can say, ah, here I've got a connection, here I don't, and, and play with that until you find it where you can connect to. Okay, now this one here is in Leesburg. Same thing happened there. The Leesburg Club said they're interested in mesh. Can we see what we can do? So I went in and I, all these green lines are things that Google Earth Excuse me, not Google Maps. I'm talking about Google Earth here, God. Google Earth, Maps won't do this. Google Earth's what you gotta do. All the green lines are between mem members of that club that we could theoretically reach. 
So this summer, or in a couple weeks, we're gonna try these green lines. We're gonna take my van over there, and we're gonna try a bunch of these lines and see how many of them we actually can do. We probably won't be able to do most of them. Yeah, you have to try them once the police comes out, or? Uh, well, no, we're gonna, I'm gonna do before that. The, good question, okay. Now, I have a link from my house to Brother Kites. Beautiful, I've never had it in the winter. I didn't have it up last year, so I'm really interested to see what happens when the foliage comes up. I've got a nice strong link. It's only about three miles. It's a thousand foot mountain, and I'm, I'm at 20 feet at the top of my roof. And so it looks like I'm gonna have a clear shot. So we'll see, yeah? Uh, talking about Google Earth, I want to mention one thing. Okay. Since like a couple of months, you can get a free license for Google Earth Pro. Mm -hmm. And Google Earth Pro has very nice feature Shot analysis. So you put a, a point on the map, you can click on it and tell Google Earth to show the view shot. And this shows you what where you have direct visibility from this point. Wow. Where it's you like, a bit, like a bright beacon light. I got you. Wow. God, thank so you for telling you that. Just and put, put the marker at a certain height and click on view shot. It, uh, it works for a minute. It shows you where you have direct visibility. Wow. Okay, I'm gonna have to try that myself. You can see outlier, like there's a mountain over here, you'll see a bright spot on the on I that got you. mountain. How cool. Wow. I'm a, I'm a cheap cheapskate. I've never gone to the pro. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna do that. Thank you very much. Okay. They, they did, they just released the so that is Google Pro is free. Wow. That, no, I'll use it immediately because I use it all the time otherwise. Okay, so this is a Leesburg group, so what we're gonna do there. Okay, now, what's it used for? Now, this is an interesting question. I've listed everything that I've found that people use it for, okay? And I think I go back to that first question where he's talking about plan B. There's no use in saying we can do this as long as the internet is working so wonderful because you're going to use the internet for all of it. But in my van, one of the things I did was I bought a Verizon extender to put it in the van, and as long as I can get an internet connection to that van, I can have five cell phones work outside out of my van. So I could go to a place where the tower, cell tower is broken or you don't have coverage, and I could give you cell phone coverage. So I sit here telling you amateurs that I'm supplying cell phone coverage. That seems like a no-win situation, let me tell you. But the important thing is, I think amateurs have got to realize, as far as emergency stuff is concerned, we've got to supply people with what they're used to. I mean, we can have, I mean, I love my radio, I love my repeater, I love doing all that. But I cannot talk to a 15-year-old about it, okay, unless he's interested in computers and very technical. So I'm trying to re make everyone realize that we can, we've got to move into this period of time. We've got to be able to supply multimedia. We've got to be able to supply these things simply. And this can do that. So that's what this is about. Um, one of the projects I'm working on now is I'm putting up, making a, a computer system which has chat, it has maps on it, it has open street maps on it, it has video conferencing, all that's complete on that unit, which I then would set up at a, some club or something that does one of these nodes. Because the idea is we'll have this backbone, it'll be there for communication, but then I want to put up certain servers that give a typical configuration of what we want to do on it. And so I'm sort of making a standard configuration of that just to do my demos when I go around showing people, because I tell people what to do, but now I want to be able to show them. So this summer I'll be able to do that. Um, I think most of this stuff is fairly obvious, I think. I mean, some of the words you might not know what they are, but I'm sure if you go and ask your, your, your children what they use on their cell phones, they'll know what most of this stuff is. Um, okay, this is a more modern version of the same thing. So what am I telling you about this one? The important thing from our point of view is the throughput on the side over there, what throughput you need to use these things, okay? Now, we amateurs are very used to the first one, text-based with low throughput. But the idea is to go up to the higher and higher throughputs, which we can do with this wideband stuff. Uh, again, I don't think I'll say any more, but like I said, this whole presentation is on the website if you want to look at it again. Okay, now I'm going back to my, my Mid-Atlantic IP network here. Okay, what we're talking about is high speed, all the media video and pictures, and when I say that, some people say, well, why do I want that? Well, I remind them that hospitals want us in x-rays, okay? There are a lot of cameras around to monitor things. So there's a lot of video going around. I think we should get connections with the repeaters. Now, the repeaters traditionally have like, you know, uh, other bands to connect to the backside. I think we need to try some of these links to use the microwave network for it. 
But if you don't want to actually link repeaters together using the network, at least you can use a network to give you an internet connection to the repeater to do some of those things with it. Uh, voice over IP, that I've done. I've been using video. I didn't bring my video phones with me now. Usually I have video phones at my demo, but this, this demonstration was so late I didn't do it. Okay, now, when I've given this speech, one of the guys stood up at one of these things, oh, so you just want to start a wide, a wide area network. You want to be an internet provider. So I made sure I put this slide in here. Said, no, this is a private network for non-commercial use. I'm not talking about being your competitor to your local internet provider. I am talking about us providing internet in an emergency where it's broken. That I'm talking about. I'm also talking about providing the ability to do everything over this network to do on the internet. But I'm not talking about providing the internet. It's two different things. Commercial. Commercial, commercial. exactly, absolutely. But, uh, emergency. An emergency, I definitely want the internet event. there. And I would say the internet could be there routinely anyway. But it's not someone's going to use this network to watch Netflix, for example. That's not what we're talking about. If you're, if you're operating under Part 97, how do you prevent uh, encrypted data okay. going over your network? So now you've brought up, and it always happens, those two poles between 97 and 15. I say that we should be amateurs on Part 15. So we don't have to answer that question. Okay, so you're not, you're not working on anything outside of Part 15? Okay, you're now... Under the Part 15... Okay. okay, now that depends on what you say. In, in Pennsylvania, Gary, 15% of his network is part 97. Because what you're really talking about is which one of these frequencies are we on, exactly from this router. And I can change the frequency of that router any th way I want to be in part 15 or part 97. That just, I just have to go in and pull down a menu, and now I'm on part 97. And over here, well, on all of them, I'm on part 15. But I can pull the menu down and say, now I'm on part 97. Aren't, aren't there issues with the EIRP also? EIRP? You do power. OK, now, now this is why I made the point here about the power. A lot of people say, OK, I want to use part 97 for power. This is 800 milliwatts and goes 55 miles with a 30 dB antenna. This is about the maximum you're allowed now. There are a few exceptions, but generally the maximum. So you don't need more power. I've never heard of anything over six watts, OK? Never. And legally, none of this equipment can be over one watt. There are a couple exceptions where you can go up to four watts, but I don't know on the top of my head. So the power one is sort of a, not a real issue, unless you want to do moon bounds, which is not what I'm talking about, OK? Um, so I don't take a position on 97 or 15, because all of these machines will do either one. And so it's sort of up to what you and your club want to do. But to answer exactly that question about encryption, why not use Part 15? If, if you can do it under the Part 15 rules. Yeah. The yeah. No, well, you can't. I mean, the encryption is no problem there. They, um, is there any uh, downside to using 15? Now? Okay, now I would say the downsides that you would run into is now we've been done out in Pennsylvania, we've done out in the suburbs and everything. When we get our first node, which is coming up within a month, in the Washington, D.C. area, we've got a, all of these units, by the way, have a spectrum analyzer built in, okay? Really nice software inside of these things. So when we do the spectrum analysis, we're going to have to choose what frequency we're going to be on. We'll do a scan of the spectrum, which these devices do. And we'll look at, we'll see who's on them. It's point to point on the backbone, so it probably is not going to be a problem. But if it is a problem, then we would choose the frequency, and that's where that question would come up. Because we might could move way up to the ham band to get away from any of the Part 15 noise. That would be one reason for going there. So, but I think we're flexible. That's the thing. The equipment will do anything you want. Okay, I try to, the, the encryption thing is a serious problem. That's why I sort of play this both ways. And I do play it both ways. I think you can do exactly what you want to do. Since the important thing here is not 15 or 97, the important thing is you get up an antenna. Because regardless of which frequency you're using, someone else wants that frequency. Your telephone company or your TV company wants that frequency. If you get one of these antennas up on your tower and you're occupying these frequencies, they're not going to occupy that frequency. So it's a little bit the Wild West I'm talking about. I want us to occupy frequencies. We've got to get there first. Otherwise, we're going to be competing with them for these frequencies. Because it's not a legal question. It's a question of occupancy. <laughs> Am I making sense on that? But I, that's why it's important to do it now. 
Squatters' rights. Squatters' rights. That's exactly correct. Because I think that's what's important is the squatters' rights. Um, okay. Uh, all right, the last point is what we're going to do about organization. I've never had this organization. I hate bureaucracy. I cannot stand organization. I mean, it just drives me crazy. I mean, it's far more complicated than in this technology. But we're getting to that point of view that over the summer there probably will be some organization just to help people coordinate. Uh, the other thing is that Elmers and stuff, people call me or send me emails asking for help, and I give them an email address of someone else. It's getting, a big, it's getting bigger than me now bigger than the five clubs that I know that are working on this. So it's coming. OK. Uh, these are the real things I hate. So I don't even want this slide in here, actually. Okay. OK, the reason this slide is in here is because all of you out there that can do the things I hate to do will go to my website and look at my presentation and take this list and make it happen. Because I'm not going to make it happen. OK. That's why this one is in here. It's not something I do. The education I do in outreach, that I do. Okay. There's a lot of communication. For example, what's going to happen is I, I'll meet someone from Ray Cesare, for example, and they'll give me their opinion on this. Or I'll meet some county official that gives me their opinion. And there are some that are really positive to it, and there are some that are really negative to it. And so I just bide my time, because I can absolutely guarantee all of you that all those that are negative to it will be positive to it in two years because this is the future, and you've got to have the bandwidth. But, so take the, all of you, you, the people in this club, look at this slide and decide what you want to do about the organization. Enough of that. OK, I'm back to this thing here now about amateurs. I really think this is important. The first one, community ownership. No state or county organization can do what we can do by the first thing. That we own it, it's private. We run it, we're not on their towers, we're not on their property, we've got the stuff, it's independent. That's important. Low cost. These things have gotten cheaper and cheaper, and the ones that don't get cheaper get faster and faster. So it's just like any technology. I, this unit here, we, I think, in, in, and we have 55 megabits per second to Pennsylvania. Gary, which doesn't go the 55 miles, he has 100 megabits per, uh, for one of these links. The new unit, which is just smaller than this one, I have 250 megabits. I've only tried it at my house, so I haven't put it in the long distance. 250 megabits. They sell even faster ones. Okay? Nobody in this room, I believe, at your house has more than maybe 30 megabits maximum. Okay? So these are very powerful, very, very good units. Low cost, really cheap. Price is going down the whole time. Okay, what are we doing? We're building a highway. Think of this network, this backbone I'm pushing as, a, as the interstate. And then you have got to build the state roads and the county roads. I'm going to help build an interstate. And I need your help to build the interstate, by the way. I need you to put an antenna on a tall building. Yeah? Are you doing anything to build the off-grid of like the solar power or something okay. so that... If you go to my website, there's a picture about halfway down the page of my first solar unit with, that we're trying. I think I have a picture in here, so I'll show you that. Okay. Now, the reason for that unit was that I want to do non-penetrating roof mounts, which you'll see a picture later. We're going to be putting one of these up in a very tall building in, in Rockville this summer. And so I wanted to be prepared to just be able to lift it up on the roof and leave it there with batteries and solar with no connections to the building. Because there are all kinds of, and this has about my getting on buildings. Okay, I was down in, Re in uh, Reston. It's wind resistant. Yes, 100 miles an hour. Okay, it's only to go to 100 miles an hour. So they say you put it on the roof, and then you have to put a cable to something else. Because if it gets over 100 miles, it's going to blow away. But they don't want it falling off the roof. Okay, so it's, it's interesting, all that stuff. So, Make sure that's not a tight roof. Yeah. So I'm down in Reston, so I'm going around to tall buildings asking them, can I put towers on their building, okay? And so I discover that there's a whole group of companies that do nothing else but go to tall buildings and pay them for all of their roof space. Mm. And then that company goes to everybody that wants to put up an antenna and leases it out to them. So the advice I got was, if you want to put an antenna on a roof of a building, make sure you go to a roof that has no antennas. Because if it has antennas, there is already a company that owns the rights to the whole thing. And they want $1,000 a month for one down in wrestling. Okay? So my, the advice was, go to buildings with no antennas, <laughs> because then you're the first one. And then you tell them, I will put this up, you will give it to me free, but you can deduct $1,000 a month 
by the donation you just gave me. <laughs> okay. All right, so that's what you tell these people to get on those buildings. And the only way to do that is to do it now before the company puts something up there and starts renting it out. That's why I'm doing this speech. This has got to happen now. But they can rent out the, once, they, once that company comes, they can rent it out for $100,000 a month or whatever it is. Well, I mean, the cheapest was 1000 the rest of them. So but, I, but for one antenna. For one antenna. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, there's 20, 30 antennas up there. So that's, that's part of the speech. OK, so we're building a highway. You have to build the local ones. And this is where the word off ramps came in. So the people that are doing mesh asked me about the mesh. I see the mesh as the off ramp from the backbone. Now I'm going to give a little bit later about more detail on this, but that's the beginning of the part of mesh. Uh, okay, and you know that you're the expertise. I've said that before. And leveraging the repeater sites, buildings, high places. Okay, so what is mesh? <clears throat> How many of you have done anything with mesh here? We've Any? done mesh in this room. Okay, so I will probably just I, I can probably skip this pretty much. Um, the only one in red here is I think is important. It's little or no management. That to me is the real advantage of the mesh, okay, in practice. Because these other systems you have to have to know a bit. So I'll skip through this about redundancy, you know it. I'll skip through it. If you don't know this, just squeak and I'll, I'll put those slower. Okay, uh, these are the nodes we put up. I've talked about that. Okay, the frequencies. I went one through one battle about people wanting to use 3.9 megahertz, I think it was. And I don't, again, it's like the 95, the part 9715, I'm agnostic. I don't care what frequency you use. Okay, I'm gonna be doing some experiments this summer on 900 megahertz, because I wanna to try to get through more trees. Okay, so I'll see how that works out. I'm also a very practical person. I don't like to talk about things I haven't done. I'll do the 900 and I'll let you know how it goes. So I really don't care what frequencies. I'm using five gigahertz. The main reason for that is not to get down on the two gigahertz main where there are a lot of uh, routers and repeaters. Um, I've got another slide which I think, now this is one of my most interesting slides. Now the problem with this slide is looking into the future and I don't have a crystal ball. But it's also wonderful to talk about because you, who knows if you're right or not. Okay, uh, the one I want to talk about is the 470 megahertz in the, in the middle. There, you know what the TV, you may know what the TV white space is. This is the area that's left when all the TV channels are pushed to other places when you went to digital TV. This space that's left is the TV white space. So there's a lot of open spectrum there. There are two things that make that interesting. One is there are companies coming with radios, say at 470 megahertz, that can do wideband stuff, not this wide, but maybe they're gonna get to two, two megahertz width. Legally, we can't do that. That's one of the problems, I think, with the amateur band, is we've got to get the rules changed so we can get some wide areas for spectrums in some of the bands that are a little lower. That would really be good. Okay, but I mean, this is a complicated stuff. I can't say, you know, I'm just giving a suggestion here. Well, you're saying that's, that would be good for disaster response. Yes. Uh, and what, do you have any idea if that's the HF affiliate? No, I, I don't. But the, the point is there are, is equipment coming in this band that does the wide band stuff. And even though that's it costs, it's very expensive today, when the price gets down, or maybe some of the amateur stuff can cover it, we might have a chance to technically use some of these bands with a wider bandwidth. But then our, the rules stop us. People cheat today by sending this stuff in, in as if it were a picture. It's not a picture, but that's a real technical definition. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. So, all right, that's one point. The other point I find really interesting, but this is in the future, okay, with this thing. It's leasing spectrum. There's no way the FCC can give enough spectrum. There isn't, a spectrum is like a natural resource. It's limited, you can't get more of it. It's there. So as we fill that spectrum up, where can we get more spectrum from? We can get it from time. Because nobody uses that frequency all the time. So you begin to time share every frequency. And this is a pressure that the hands are gonna run into. If the government squeezes the spectrum and there's no more, say they take away an amateur band or something and there's no more, the way you could still do it, and this is what they're doing in the TV white spaces, is you connect to a computer and say, I want this frequency whenever it's free, and you lease it for two seconds, five seconds, for an hour, and then you give it back. So you timeshare spectrum. That's a new thing the FCC is trying.
So there's spread spectrum sharing? So, yes, I guess you could call it spread spectrum sharing. All right, so this is a new concept. And I just want to throw it out there to let you know the world we're coming into. Okay, that's the only thing important in that slide. It's sort of like visionary stuff. Okay, this is an old slide. I just wanted to show you because I thought it was technically good. This was the first presentation I did on the Linksys routers. And I don't know, you said you've done mesh stuff so you know what the slide is. This is just the frequencies that were in the first link router, the different channels they had and how you use them. So it's there a little bit for historic reasons and if there's somebody that doesn't understand it, I could go into it in more detail about the channels that were allocated in that old uh, router. And I thought it was a nice slide, so I kept it. Okay, band selection I mentioned a little bit. I'm, just, I'm a very practical person. I don't care what band you use. These units have a spectrum analyzer in them. So you put one up, you do your spectrum, find what frequencies on it, and then choose, as, at least as far as the band. These are five gigahertz. So is collision scheduling something that you Pay attention to. No, I have, you're doing it with the spectrum yeah, analyzer. Yeah, exactly. Right? But I have never had a problem because I haven't. So far, I haven't gotten to the middle of the city yet. When we do our first links down into Rockville now, we'll see what the trouble is. I don't expect I'm going to have a problem because I'm going to be doing point to point. But you're already in cities in Maryland. Oh, yeah, well, if you consider Frederick a city, I mean, that's why. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what's happening? Going you know, in Damascus, yes. But see, we're up high on the mountain, point to point. There's nobody there. When we get down in the city and we get down, say, here or in Reston and stuff, there's so much more. So that's, that's what I'm thinking there might be a problem. I don't know. Do you I think mean, you would ever use something like Bluetooth where you have the frequency mapping between 79 different channels to are, avoid are the some, these, some, are, so, some of these repeaters do that, okay? I mean, if I, if I take a link system and I, uh, I do Ubiquity or the link system and I don't tell it which channel to use, it will switch automatically, okay? And, and I don't know how often it checks the switch, yeah? To an empty. To an empty, or less used, yes. Um, and so they do that, but I don't think there's any hot switch, I don't think there's any constant switching in. I think they do it just after a need, if the throughput goes down or something. I've never really looked at the algorithms, but they're on the web to get more details about when they decide to change frequency. But on the backbone, I don't allow them to do that. I choose one frequency and lock it on that frequency, clear frequency, and leave it there. Because this has to do with the squatter thing I'm telling you about. If I occupy that, if I do 40 it megahertz wide on this frequency, it's mine. But it's only a spatial uh, residency. Yes, exactly. Because in that, in that physical environment, it's being used, but yeah. 100 yards away. Yeah, it's not my problem, 100 yards away. I mean, the, this is a five, inch, a five degree uh, beam. So it does a pretty narrow, narrow beam. Of course, in 55 miles, it's pretty wide, but still. Okay, um, the only thing I want to mention about this one is the last one here. This AC here, I bought two of these units, a new one that's been out for about a year now. It's just now becoming out on the market where people will see it. You'll notice it says 500 megabits next to it. All right, now that sounds great. So having 500 megabits is really good. But this thing starts at an 80 megahertz bandwidth. Okay, I'm using 10 megahertz for my stuff, most of it. 20 at most. This uses 80 in order to get that throughput. You realize you'll occupy the whole band, basically, with these new units. But where you've got point to point, you can do it. So these would be an excellent thing for point to point. <coughs> but I cannot imagine you getting 80 megahertz of free bandwidth just routinely. But I just want to mention that stand because it's relatively new. I have not used it on anything, even though I have the units. Okay, I'm not going to go this. You've asked that question about 15 and 97. I sort of gave me my opinion on it. Um, again, I'm interested in the point to point. I think the mesh stuff, well, I'm going to come to the mesh more because I think that's very relevant there. Okay, power I've talked about, this 80 milliwatt antenna going into a 30 dB dish. Power is not a problem. I mean, you can go more. Okay, this is a, a, a quick slide about the speeds, I started off in my first presentation saying 24, then I went to 150, now I'm at 250 to 500 megabits per second. I want to draw your attention to D-Star. I'm nothing against narrow band communication, but that's not what I'm talking about. Okay, I'm talking about a lot, a lot more, a lot more speed. And this had to do with that white space I was talking about. We could get more of this in the white, yes, go ahead. Back up one slide, it looks to me like you violate the rules of 800 miles. Okay. Uh, this, this one I, 
I probably can't use this at the, at the whole, let me think. I think I turned this one down to 27 dB gain on, on the, excuse me, the power on the amplifier rather than the full amount in order to meet the rules because we're right on the edge of it if I use the whole, the whole sure. speed. Sure. I don't go into the usually. I've, I've seen system. the problem with people, I mean, you think everybody in the world is doing it already. Oh yeah. They're running a, running a watt and you can buy three and five and 10 watt amplifiers too. Uh, um, I was, I, would, I, I mean, yeah, I go down to 27 dB. I was going to put this up as a test the other day, just to do a test, but I realized if I'm putting out 600 watts and it's the height of a person, that's really not something I want to do. You know, I've got to be up high for that. And, and so there, there are risks and things involved. If you look at the radiation problem, because the aperture of the antenna is so large that you can't even come close to hitting 10 milliwatts per square centimeter. Even yeah, even at six hundred, that's good to know. Okay, so now I went back to this again. I'm not going to stay on that. We'll get to this one. I will answer over the summer when I put up the servers. Okay, okay. How far do we operate? I like this slide. Okay, da 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 da. And the one I want to talk about is this last one. When people talk to me about how far can we go, what speed you can get. And the real answer to this is that I'm transmitting to, to a red lion. I have no interference and everything is going fine and I might get 100 millibits, megabits per second. Okay, the rain comes, I get a little higher error rate. So far we've had no trouble with weather. Something else happens, I get noise, somebody else puts up an antenna. Something happens when my rate goes down, okay? What's happening? The transmitter's still reaching it. Things are still working. What's happened is the error rate goes up. So every time I send a message, I have to send it twice. If I send it twice, my throughput just went in half. So that when you talk about throughput, you're talking really, it's probably a, a property of your error rate. Okay, that something's causing error, so you're having to retransmit, because these things are all automatic. By the way, these are all simplex. All these units are simplex. They transmit, then they receive, then they transmit and receive, turning off and on very fast. Okay, there are duplex units, but they're more expensive. Okay, so the throughput is what's really the interesting thing, is what's your throughput. So when someone asks me what size antenna I need, how high I have to be, the first question is what throughput must do you have to have? Because you can use a, a smaller antenna and that to tolerate more noise if you don't have the throughput. But anyway, that's why I like that slide. Okay, site acquisition. This is a new slide for me. I really would like for you to get places to put these antennas on. All right. Now, the last one in this about the legal legal business. I when I started out this, I learned something really the hard way. I want to put an antenna on your repeater site. What repeater site? <laughs> well, uh, we had the guy that that was ten years ago. I haven't even talked to the people since then. Nobody, or not, shouldn't say nobody. A lot of people wouldn't help me put something on their repeater site because they didn't dare go to the repeater site to ask to put anything on. Okay, that was a total shock to me. So remember, when you do something today, if you go to a new place and put it up, try to get some kind of agreement saying you're there, so that in 10 years from now, you'll have to pretend you've never been there. That was a shock to me, really bad to me. All right, uh, <coughs> this is stuff from another website, which I can give you a link to. I do have it at the bottom about what to handle when you're putting stuff at sites. Path analysis. There are a lot of ways to do this. I can be honest, I'm looking at the backbone. I go to Google Earth and that's my path analysis. Now when I get down here or I get to lower places where I don't have high mountains, I'm gonna have to do a better path analysis. Because so far I've been doing high places. But there are a lot of tools on the web to do this, okay? I'm going to, I'll come to that later. This is what they call it. I'm going to go through this. How much more time do I have? Okay, it's an hour now. So I have way too much. So I'm going to go fast. Okay, this is all on the website. This whole presentation is on the website. You do a link analysis. You start out with your antennas. You add your dB values to it. You plus and minus them. And you calculate how many dB is left. Uh, what, how many plus dB do I have left? And if that's good enough, you go for it. Otherwise, you get bigger antennas that go higher. This is what you do in the analysis. Okay, so I'm just going to hop through this. I've used up all my time. A lot of antennas I've looked at. I'm not going to spend time with that. Your first station, everybody was talking about link systems. They're getting old now. They're going to abandon them. So I've recommended that people buy a nano station. 
you says in two there. I personally like five gigahertz, but I think two gigahertz is good for learning. See, eighty-six dollars is the price. I don't have time to go through all. These are my first nodes that I did with my tests. I usually have in my demos. Okay, IP. How many of you have heard the expression "everything over IP"? Okay, uh, Internet of Things. This was interesting. I went. To, I gave this presentation at U.S. Geological Survey. That's why the earthquake detector is on there. Time server I have in my van. You'll notice all this stuff at the bottom. Door sensor, sewer ports. You know what is it called? X10. How many of you have ever used X10? Okay. IP is the new X10. Okay. <laughs> that, that's just the way it is. Everything you have on X10 is going to be all over. Every kind of Wi-Fi kind of thing you can imagine. Okay. I mean, it's just coming. Tons of it. prices are going down. It's still expensive some of it right now. Security is something I'd worry about with everything. <laughs> Oh, okay. Oh, good. I'm over time now, but we got to take that up. Okay, now I'm just getting to the end of the presentation, which was uh, in common. I don't have a lot of time for it. Uh, I'd say the last two are probably what I want to emphasize. In, a, in another month, I'll have a server set up with a lot of this stuff on it, so I can actually show you what to do with it. Um, there's one thing I would like to say. For example, I've made some hands. Yes, you had a question? Okay, I told you, I have a van, which you'll see a picture of later, and the idea with that was I wanted to convince people of what we should provide to an emergency organization. And one of the things that you want to provide to anybody is a cell phone. That is the most universal instrument we have today. Everybody has it, everybody uses it. So what I did is I put the uh, uh, Verizon extender in my van, so if I can connect to an internet somewhere, I can have a mini cell tower in my van, because I was trying to show that You've got to open up. I mean, it's great with DRATS, it's great with HF, but we want to cover everything, including cell phones. And I picked cell phone because it was the most irritating thing I could think of. Okay. I mean, if we get amateurs to support cell phones, I've worked a miracle, okay? But, but that's kind of implied. If you're already covering Wi-Fi, if you look at Windows Mobile phones, they're using Skype as their backhaul. Exactly. So if you're providing a Wi-Fi type service, yep. anybody who has a Skype app, which is yep. almost everybody, has yep. cellular signal. Yep, exactly. But it was just one more thing I wanted to offer them so that they don't argue with me. Right. Okay. Because I mean, you can, can't believe that people can imagine unbelievable things to say why this will never work, even though it's working in a lot of places. <laughs> Actually, if you want to uh, provide cell phone connection, you can run uh, soft uh, TS on your, uh, on your machine. Yes. And you can, people then can use uh, your, your base station with their uh, phone. They don't need any software on their phones, any additional services. Yes. Just bring your cell phone, the dumbest phone will work today. Yes, I, uh, we can come back, yes. Okay, oh boy. <laughs> okay, forms, we want forms. Got tons of forms for people that need forms. Okay, air control, this is the program I use. So one of the things about mesh and not mesh is I want really sophisticated professional tools to run the backbone. I've got them in the Ubiquiti equipment. Not only do I have the spectrum analysis, I've got everything I need to manage that backbone. Okay, maybe the mesh will have it. I hope they do. Okay, five minutes. Oh God, do I have any time for this? I have time to click on it. Maybe. No, I don't. Okay, that's all right. All right, so no more demos. This is my van. It's the last thing. I bought this van. I use it for my tests. It's a 42 foot pneumatic antenna on it. Uh, Amran had one down here, I know. And I use this for doing all my tests. And that's it. Whoa. Whoa.